Praise the Lord. Welcome to today's Dandy Way Bible Study. I am Dr. Tunji Yakintilo, and I'm excited. Yes, I'm excited to welcome everyone to today's Bible study. We continue our study of the book of Genesis. Uh, we are on Genesis chapter 38. Today we proceed with part two of our study of chapter 38. So let's start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, this privilege and opportunity to study your word today. We pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit will be our guide, will be our teacher, will open our eyes and open our hearts to your word. We pray, Lord, that uh, the Holy Spirit will do that in our lives, which brings honor and glory to your holy name through your word today and every day of our lives. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. So, Genesis chapter 38, the title of our discussion again today is The Seed is the Blessing. The Seed is the Blessing. Uh, let's go straight to the scriptures. We are going to read uh, Genesis 38 verses 1 to 10. Genesis 38 verses 1 to 10. And you can get your Bibles and read along. Praise God. I have the New King James Version. I start from verse 1. It came to pass at that time that Judah departed from his brothers and visited a certain Adulamite whose name was Hira. And Judah saw there a daughter of a certain, certain Canaanite whose name was Shua. And he married her and went into her. So she conceived and bore a son, and he called his name Ur. She conceived again and bore a son, and she called his name Onan. And she conceived yet again and bore a son, and called his name Shelah. He was at Jezeb when she bore him. Then Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn. Her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord killed him. And Judah said to Onan, Go into your brother's wife and marry her, and raise up an heir to your brother. But Onan knew that the heir would not be his. And it came to pass, when he went into his brother's wife, that he emitted on the ground, lest he should give an heir to his brother. And the thing which he did displeased the Lord. Therefore, he killed him also. And I can say, Selah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So, uh, Genesis 38, I just read verses 1 uh, to 10. And uh, we have a preface for today's discussion, which is found in the book of Isaiah, uh, chapter 53, verse 2. I have it shown on the screen here. And I'm going to read. He has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. This is Isaiah the prophet talking about the coming Messiah. Okay? Jesus Christ. That the coming Messiah, when he comes, is going to come in simplicity. There is no glamour, no form, no comeliness. Actually, that when we see him, there is no beauty that will desire him. And that was exactly what happened. That actually the nation of Israel missed the Messiah. They missed Jesus Christ, the Messiah. You know, because it contradicts the expectation. They were expecting, you know, this Messiah who is going to deliver them from the dominion uh, of, of Roman Empire at the time, and it's going to be great, it's going to be mighty, it's going to come with so much pomp and pageantry. And it appears that was the expectation, but Jesus Christ came, as the prophet said here, no form of comeliness. And when we see him, there's no beauty. In fact, the way Jesus Christ came, the Jewish nation missed him completely. It's like you blink, you miss it. 
That is exactly what the prophet is telling us. Now, there is a similarity, the correlate that we want to take out of this verse to apply to Genesis chapter 38 is Genesis chapter 38 is peculiar. Okay? If I want to confess, maybe before I do that, I gave an assignment last time that, you know, we should read the whole chapter. Okay? Uh, it's chapter uh, verse 30 verses. We only read the first 10 verses, but you can still go ahead and read the rest of the chapter. I must confess, this is the most challenging chapter that I have come across so far in this series of study of the book of Genesis. It's the most difficult that I've come across, okay? Apparently, it is veiled. I want to believe that there is no way the Old Testament people could have understood this chapter because he focus, the focus is on Messiah's genealogy, and you can only understand this chapter in light of revelation of the, of the Messiah, which did not happen until the New Testament time. So we can only understand Genesis chapter 38 in the light of the New Testament, which even the Jewish people don't, they don't subscribe to till this day. Okay? So, this chapter is difficult to understand. It, it, it's kind of bizarre in, in a lot of ways. Okay? And we see God kill two sons of, of Judah. I mean, if that doesn't shock you, I don't know what will. Okay? We don't know what kind of sin that Ur, the firstborn of Judah, committed. In verse 3, we are told, so she conceived and bore his son and called his name Ur. Ur itself, in English, <laughs> is going to sound, you know, I'm not trying to pollute the language, it's going to sound like error. But if we look it up in uh, the concordance, let's look at the meaning of Ur. Ur means watchful. Watchful. Anyway, Watchful did something, and God called him wicked, and the Lord killed him, in verse 7. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord killed him. That doesn't sound like God, the Lord that we know, the Lord of grace, <laughs> the Lord of grace that we know in this New Testament age. And then it happened again with Onan. Now we know what Onan did. Onan was deceptive with the culture of the time. What he was supposed to do, he was deceptive with Tamar, the widow of Ur. Verse 10, and the thing which he did displeased the Lord, therefore he killed him also. Those are the challenges of Genesis chapter 38. Another challenge is if we read the old chapter, uh, it talked about Judah, Having three children, talked about Judah having illicit affair with Tamar, the daughter-in-law, who bore uh, uh, Phares and Sheila. That was, that was at the end of, uh, and Zira, okay? So, time enough between Judah having those three children, Ur, Onan, and Sheila to grow up and then time enough for Judah to have another a set of twins, okay? Be, and if we look at, let's back up a little. If we look at the time that in chapter 37 that Joseph was sold into slavery, between the time he was sold into slavery and the time that he became prime minister of Israel, uh, a prime minister of Egypt, okay? And Israel, who is Jacob and his family, with Pharez having two sons, moving to Egypt will be about 23 years. I hope I'm making some sense here, okay? Because in Genesis chapter 37, we found Joseph sold into slavery. 
he was taken to Egypt. Between that time and the time that he became prime minister, and uh, all Jacob's family moved to Egypt about 23 years. So in that 23 years, it would be a challenge for Judah to have three children who grew up, have two more children who grew up, because at that time, Pharaoh already had two children. So there is a challenging time. Actually, scholars said, uh, proposing that this incident of Judah getting married to the daughter of Shua, the Canaanite, likely happened in Shechem, when Jacob was in Shechem. When Dinah also went to Shechem and she got raped, that is most likely around the time that all of this narrative started. So bottom line is Genesis chapter 38 is a challenge. Okay. However, there are still some clear principles that we can pull out of the chapter. Actually, we have six that I've seen here. Okay. There will be more. <laughs> I'm sure, definitely sure there are more. But these are the six that, you know, the main ones that are pulled out for us to study, to take a look at. The first is what we have started already, that the seed is the blessing. Next, some things are sacred. Number three, choose friends wisely. Number four, judge not. Number five, God is sovereign. And number six, the grace of God. So we are going to start our discussion with the seed is the blessing. And I am I know I'm going to shock some people, <laughs> okay, to be clear, and the Word of God tells us this, that the material blessing, even if you look at Joseph, for him to become the Prime Minister of Egypt, and all the material blessing that he had, all of those things are good, but those are not the core blessing. The core blessing is the seed. The material things that goes with it, nothing wrong with them. They are fringe benefit. Okay? If we look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 and 16. Let's go there real quick. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 and 16. We are told, do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. The material glamour of this world, the material gain of this world, are not the blessing. Okay? They are the fringe benefit of the blessing. The seed... The Messiah, getting to know Jesus Christ, is the blessing. When you get that, the material things that goes with it are just fringe benefit. And the seed, though unimpressive, not glamorous, in fact cryptic, just like Genesis chapter 38 is a really cryptic chapter <laughs> to me <laughs> maybe i don't understand much but to me it's still cryptic mysterious all right you know this person was bad god killed him the next one comes along god killed him and somebody i mean judah went to commit incest and nothing happened to him if he was proposing that the daughter-in-law should be killed we're going to get to that so, this Genesis chapter 38 is, is really, I, I would just summarize it as a sacred chapter because it's dealing with the issue of the Messiah, the seed, the real blessing. Let's read Isaiah 53 once again. Isaiah 53 verses 1 to 3. Isaiah 53 verses 1 to 3. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For it shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. 
He is despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised. And we did not esteem him. If you look at Genesis chapter 37, the glorious beginning is coming in the life of Joseph. And it continues in Genesis chapter 39. He switched in between like this divine interlude. Is this dull, veiled, cryptic, mysterious, <laughs> and I would say sacred chapter. Okay? And I would say once again that Material blessings are only a fringe benefit. The real blessing is getting to know the Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Being reconnected back to God through our Lord Jesus. That is the blessing. And I don't want, you know, because when we talk about material things sometimes, if somebody just jumps in, he's going to say, oh, Christianity is about getting rich. No, Christianity is about getting to know the Lord Jesus, getting to know God through the Lord Jesus. And the blood material things that now goes with it, goes with it. Those are good. <laughs> we should take them and enjoy them. But that is not the call of the blessing. The seed, once again, is the blessing. Now, let's go to the second principle or the, or the major theme. That some things are sacred. I said, as I proposed, that this chapter 38 is sacred, okay? Apparently, issue of the seed or the Messiah is sacred, directly supervised by God. God made the pronouncement in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, okay? And we read this the last time. He said, told the, uh, uh, the, the devil that the seed will bruise your head. You will bruise his heel, but it will bruise your head. Now let's read uh, verse 7 of Genesis 38 that we are on. How God was supervising this. Judah has been chosen by God to be the bearer of the seed. Ur, who will have been the next in line to carry the seed, was wicked. And God himself was supervising the track of the genealogy of our Lord Jesus. So, or was eliminated. And if we go to verse 10, the same thing with Onan, he displeased the Lord, said, no, you cannot be a deceived. Out. And in verse 18, let's read verse 18. Genesis 38, 18. Uh, this is giving an account of how Judah ended up committing incest with the daughter-in-law. He didn't know because the woman was veiled as an harlot, but that is still, I mean, that is still like adultery, at least, that he should know, all right? And he had a sexual relationship with Tamar, thinking she was a harlot or a prostitute. So the seed is sacred. God allowed that because he's God. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, we have a few more examples of things that are sacred. Approaching God in the Old Testament days is sacred. God gave specific instructions through Moses to the priests. Moses was told to build the tabernacle, and he, God gave him instructions of these exact steps that the priests have to go through, even the incense that they burn on the uh, table of altar, table of incense, has a specific composition. Now, Nadab and Abihu, these are the sons of Aaron. They made up their own spice, their own uh, incense, burning before the Lord. And let's see what happened. Leviticus chapter 10. Leviticus chapter 10, we're going to read verses 1 and 2. Leviticus 10, 1 and 2. Then Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took a censer and put fire in it, put incense on it, and offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. They just did their own thing. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. And I take a break for an emphasis there. 
Because some of us think, you know, God doesn't kill nobody. In this New Testament age, he probably doesn't. But I won't take the chance. Now, um, approaching God, if it's sacred in the Old Testament, and God says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, God changes not. Approaching God in this New Testament age is sacred as well. And we find how the, we can approach God. In John chapter 14, verse 6. John 14, 6. Jesus Christ talking here. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no one comes to the Father except through me. No one is the emphasis. The only way anybody can approach the Father and enter into God's presence is only through Jesus Christ. Any other way is deception. It's not prescribed by God. And, you know, you may not get zapped <laughs> like Nadab and Abihu, but you won't be approaching God. That's just the bottom line. And we can leave that there for now. Another secret thing is the matter of the rock. There are some spiritual principles that should not be violated. Moses struck the rock twice, as we find in Exodus 17.6 and Numbers 28-12. And he got the punishment that he was, he was not allowed to enter the promised land. He prayed hard for it, and he was allowed to see but he did not enter the promised land in the human flesh. Uh, later, in the, at the Mount of Transfiguration, we can say, well, he came back. The Lord still granted him the grace to step on the promised land in a new body. But in the human flesh, he did not enter the promised land. That was his punishment for striking the rod twice and being disobedient to God. Okay, so we go to the next main Theme, choose your friends wisely. Yes, Judah chose an Adulamite as a friend. And it's kind of interesting the way Genesis 38 started, that it came to pass at that time that Judah departed from his brothers. He left his brothers and visited a certain Adulamite. As I mentioned before, this incident likely happened when they were in Shechem. Adulamite was was a Canaanite, okay? And we can say there isn't much, you know, to say about that, but if you go to verse 20, we can see Adulamite colluding with Judah in the Tamar incident. Or maybe it's the other way around, okay? They were colluding. They were partners in crime. Verse 20, and Judah sent the young goat by the hand of his friend, the Adulamite, to receive his pledge from the woman's hand, but he did not find her. After, you know, Ju Judah promised the woman, I'm going to give you a goat, the woman said, hey, give me a pledge. Where's the goat? You don't have the goat with you. Give me something that's going to, you know, guarantee that you give me the goat. So he gave her his staff, gave her his signet ring, and... When Judah went back, he now sent a goat through Adulamite to go pick up his staff and his pledge from the woman, and the woman could not be found. So they were colluding in this evil. We find this collaboration in evil, which is likely an influence of Adulamite on Judah, because the bad will always corrupt the good. <laughs> okay? Always. If... If you can be too careful to avoid evil. Because if you're dining with evil and sitting down with evil and liming with evil and you're doing all of it, they're going to influence you. In fact, we find in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 20. Let's read Proverbs 13, 20. See what the Bible tells us about that. He who works with wise men will be wise. But the companion of fools will be destroyed. Chapter 22, 
verses 24 and 25. That is, this is still Proverbs, okay? 24 and 25. Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man do not go, lest you learn his ways and set a snare for your soul. The angry man is, is, is just, you know, he has to attach to something. So you can put sinful here. Uh, non-Christian here, you know, make no friendship with someone like that because their attitude is going to affect you. In fact, we are told more precisely in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? Because the unbeliever is going to affect... You can imagine the good person, the believer, like, you know, standing on an edge of a cliff and trying to pull up somebody way down. If you're not careful... The person standing on the edge, you're going to get pulled down and they're going to lose it together. So, as the saying goes, show me your friend <laughs> and I tell you who you are. So, we should choose our friends wisely. Let's remember this verse that we read in the book of Proverbs. He who walks with the wise will become wise, but the companion of fools will suffer. So, Next main theme, and that is judge not. We uh, did this in more, we studied this in more detail before, so we'll do a quick review of judge not today. Here in chapter 38, we found Judah making himself a judge over Tema, and he was all wrong, 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 wrong. Because in any situation where we are judging, we are making ourselves a judge over the person or over the situation. The problem is, we often judge in the same area in which we are guilty. We found another example in the case of David and Bathsheba. David committed adultery with Bathsheba killed Uriel, the husband, and forgot about it, thought everything was, you know, covered up, nice, <laughs> and, and gone. But the Lord sent the prophet to David and gave him a story to mimic the sin that he committed. In a lesser level, because we were talking about animals, you know, sheep. What did David say? That somebody that took another person's sheep, that, that person is not fit to live. <laughs> if you kill him. And remember what the prophet told David that thou art the man. You are the one that stole somebody else's only sheep, even though you have several in your own harem. <laughs> okay? Thou art the man. Anytime you're tempted to judge, remember. Thou art the man. And Jesus Christ actually tells us, Judge not, that ye be not judged. That's Matthew chapter 7 verse 1 in the original King James. So before judging, we should ask ourselves this question. Do I have jurisdiction or authority over, the, over this issue? Okay? Because many times we find people that are judging situations, circumstances that frankly and none of their business and you remember that authority has to be given if you have not been given authority in a particular area leave it alone okay i can give an example you know we all just went through the covid 19 pandemic and there are people that take it upon themselves to be making judgmental statement about covid 19 they may be doctors, but they are not virologists, and the government did not give them authority to address this issue. Meanwhile, they take it on themselves and doing protests and confusing the masses, and it's just a mess. It was a mess. So unless you have the authority, 
or jurisdiction, okay, because a policeman in a certain county has authority in that county, not in another state 500 miles away, <laughs> okay? Even the next state, you don't have authority. The next county, you don't have authority in the next county, all right? So, do you have authority in this particular situation? And am I judging the scene or judging the person? <laughs> Most importantly, am I guilty of the same offense? Because many a time, we judge the same faults, the same sin that we are guilty of. A anytime you see yourself so vehement and judging a particular sin, check yourself. You probably have the same sin in your life or the same fault. <clears throat> Once again, Jesus Christ said, Judge not, that ye be not judged. Praise the Lord. So let's talk about We have two big, two huge issues left to, 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 to touch on. We are only going to scratch the surface in these next two uh, major themes that we're discussing. Uh, number one is God is sovereign. Judah was chosen as the bearer of the seed, not because of anything he has done right. In fact, the account we are finding about Judah is that the things that he did wrong, wrong, wrong. But God already chosen, even though he likely didn't know about it, and it's possible because he didn't, there was no hint of it until when Jacob was in his deathbed and he was blessing his children and he mentioned the scepter for Judah. That the scepter shall not depart from between his legs. So, uh, Judah was chosen by grace. Just like you and I <laughs> have been chosen for salvation by grace and by grace alone. Let's read um, uh, about, we're talking about sovereignty of God, okay? God, out of his sovereignty, chose Judah, because God is God. Let's read First Chronicles chapter 29, verse 11. We have it here on the screen, so I'll read it. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heaven and in, and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted head Above all, God owns all these things. He can do whatsoever he pleases, and none of us <laughs> can challenge him on anything, okay? So, sometimes you see certain people are blessed. <laughs> you wonder, but this guy was a party animal. <laughs> I know him, you know, he, and God just chose him, and he's accomplishing wonderful things for God, and he just marvels you. God is sovereign. He can choose. Because he owns it all. Praise the Lord. And the issue of God's sovereignty now rolls into the grace of God. Okay? Because Judah was chosen as the bearer of the seed, as I mentioned a while ago, not because of anything he did right. All that we know he was doing was wrong, wrong, wrong. And he was still chosen to be the bearer of the seed, to fall in line of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. It is by grace not by works. Even today, that those of us that are saved through Jesus Christ, it is by grace. There's nothing we have done to deserve it. Let's read Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. And just like there is nothing anybody can do to earn salvation, there's nothing that you can do that will disqualify you either if you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, no matter what you have done before, the blood of Christ that was shed on the cross wipes away all sin. And now... If you take Jesus Christ, accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you become a new creature. All things are passed away. 
And behold, all things become new in your life. If you have not done that yet, do that today. Because that is the only way to approach God, to get in touch with God, to get into God's presence. Only through Christ. Praise God. That concludes our study of Genesis chapter 38. And looking forward uh, to next time when we start Genesis 39. God bless you. We'll see you then.